Hey everyone, my name's Ian Gordon and I'm the author of Foundations of Scalable Systems. This video supports the materials in Chapter 1 of the book. And in this module, I'll start to explore exactly what is meant by the term scalability. Turns out it's not as simple as most of us think. Intuitively, scalability is a pretty straightforward concept. If we ask Wikipedia for a definition, it tells us scalability is the property of a system to handle a growing amount of work by adding resources to the system. That all seems really quite reasonable. So let's examine how we scale systems in the real world. We all know how to scale a highway system. We just add more traffic lanes so it can handle a greater number of vehicles. Some of my favorite people know how to scale beer production. They add more capacity in terms of the number and size of brewing vessels and the number of staff to perform and manage the brewing process and the number of kegs they can fill every day with tasty brews. Think of any physical system, a transit system, an airport, elevators in a building, and how we increase the capacity is pretty obvious. However, unlike physical systems, software systems are somewhat amorphous. They're not something you can point at, see, touch, feel, and get a sense of how it behaves from external observation. It's a digital artifact. At its core, the streams of ones and zeros that make up executable code and data are hard for anyone to tell apart. So what does scalability mean in terms of a software system? Put very simply, and without getting into definition wars, scalability defines a software system's capability to handle growth in some dimension of its operations. Example operational dimensions are the number of simultaneous requests a system can handle or the amount of data it can process and manage. Maybe it's to do with the value that can be derived from the data that the system stores through predictive analytics and it's the ability to maintain a stable consistent response time as request loads grow over time. For example, let's imagine a major supermarket chain is rapidly opening new stores and increasing the number of self-checkout kiosks in every store. This requires the core supermarket systems to be scaled to handle the increased volume from item scanning without decreased response times and to store much greater data volumes generated from all these new sales. We also need to be able to analyze these sales to perhaps predict where stock is going to be needed due to regional differences and events or weather conditions. All of these dimensions are effectively the scalability requirements of the system. If over a year the supermarket chain opens 100 new stores and grows sales by 400 times, then the software system needs to scale to provide the necessary processing capacity to enable the supermarket to operate efficiently. Of course, if our systems don't scale, we could lose sales as our customers become unhappy. We might hold stock that doesn't get sold quickly and this increase our costs. We might miss opportunities to increase sales by responding to local circumstances with specials to our customers. All of these reduce customer satisfaction and profits and none are good for business and can lead to business failure. Successful scaling is therefore crucial for our imaginary supermarkets business growth and likewise is in fact the lifeblood of many modern internet applications. But for most business and government systems, scalability really isn't a primary quality requirement in the early stages of development and deployment. New features to enhance usability and utility become the drivers of our development cycles. As long as performance is adequate under the loads we experience, we keep adding new user-facing features to enhance the system's business value. In fact, introducing some of the sophisticated technologies I'll describe later in this series of videos can actually handicap a project because it increases complexity and causes development inertia. Still, it's not uncommon for systems to evolve into a state where enhanced performance and scalability become a matter of urgency and even survival. Attractive features with high utility breed success, and this brings more requests to handle and more data to manage. Often a tipping point is reached where design decisions that made sense under light loads are now suddenly technical debt. External trigger events often cause these tipping points. 
Look at the press from April 2020 for many reports of government unemployment systems and supermarket online ordering sites that crashed under the increased demand caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Increasing a system's capacity in some dimension by increasing resources is called scaling up or scaling out. I'll explore the difference between these two in a later video. In addition, unlike physical systems, it's often equally important to be able to scale down the capacity of a system to remove unused resources. A great example of this is Netflix, which has a predictable diurnal request load that it needs to process. What does that mean? Simply, a lot more people are watching Netflix in any geographical region at 9pm at night than are at 5am in the morning. That makes sense, obviously. But this enables Netflix to reduce the processing resources that it has to deploy during times of lower load. Compare this to a highway system. At night, when few cars are on the road, we don't retract lanes, except if we're doing repairs. The full capacity of the road is available for drivers to go as fast as they like. In software systems, we can expand and contract the processing capacity of our systems in a matter of seconds to handle instantaneous load changes. Compared to physical systems, the strategies we deploy are very, very different. So, as I explained earlier, the basic aim of scaling a system is to increase its capacity in some application-specific dimension. A common dimension is increasing the number of requests that a system can process in any given time period. This is known as the system's throughput. Let's explore this with a couple of examples. In 1932, one of the world's great icons, the Sydney Harbour Bridge, was opened. Now, it's fairly safe to assume that traffic volumes in 2021 are somewhat higher than in 1932. If by any chance you've driven over the bridge at peak hour in the last 20 years or so, then you know that its capacity is exceeded considerably every day. So how do we increase the capacity of physical systems such as bridges? This issue became prominent in Sydney in the 80s when it was realised that the capacity of the harbour crossing had to be increased. The solution was that rather less iconic Sydney Harbour Tunnel, which essentially follows the same route underneath the harbour. This provides four more lanes of traffic and hence added roughly one third more capacity to the harbour crossing. This example illustrates the first strategy we have in software systems to increase capacity. We basically replicate the software processing resources to provide more capacity to handle requests and thus increase our throughput, as shown on the slide here. These replicated processing resources are analogous to the traffic lanes on bridges, providing a mostly independent processing pathway for a stream of arriving requests. Luckily, in modern software systems, replication can be achieved at the click of a mouse, and we can effectively replicate our processing resources thousands and thousands of times. We have it a lot easier than bridge builders. Still, we need to take care to replicate resources in order to alleviate real bottlenecks. Adding capacity to processing paths that are not overwhelmed will simply cause needless costs and give no scalability benefits. The second strategy for scaling our systems can also be illustrated with our bridge example. In Sydney, some observant person realised that in the mornings, a lot more vehicles cross the bridge from north to south, where the city is, and in the afternoon, people leave the city, crossing from south to north. The reverse pattern. A smart solution was therefore devised. Allocate more lanes of traffic for the high demand direction in the morning from north to south, and sometime low demand in the afternoon, switch this around. This effectively increased the capacity of the bridge without allocating any new resources. We optimised the resources we already had available. We can follow this same approach in software to scale our systems. If we can somehow optimise our processing by maybe using more efficient algorithms, adding extra indices in our databases to speed up queries, or even rewriting our server in a faster programming language, we can increase our capacity without increasing resources. A great example of this is Facebook's creation of the now discontinued hip hop for PHP, which increased the speed of Facebook's web page generation by six times by compiling PHP into C++. I'll revisit these two design principles, namely replication and optimization, many times in the remainder of this series of videos. 
you'll see that there are many complex implications of adopting these principles that arise simply from the fact that we are building distributed systems. Distributed systems have properties that make building scalable systems interesting, where interesting in this context has both positive and negative connotations. So scalability is about increasing the capacity of a system in some application specific dimension. And we do this through replication and optimization. In the next video, I'm going to expand this thinking about scalability to include the costs of the systems that we build. Thanks for watching.